Everybody has watched, either on the evening news or perilously close in person, as a thundering aircraft barrels through smoky skies to discharge a huge bloom of pink-red fluid over a wildfire. The urgent drama has been part of the American landscape since the 1950s. The frequent inaccessibility of wildfire sites makes the use of aircraft especially attractive as a tool to subdue fires. Evaluations with sprayers, small aircraft dropping small amounts of water, and even a B-29 loosing water-filled drop tanks and bomb casings suggested there was something to gain from fighting fires from the air. But it remained for serious tests of war surplus steermen and N-3N biplane trainers, TBM Avenger torpedo bombers, and then B-25s fitted with fluid tanks in the 1950s to make the case. Into the 1960s, the availability of World War II vintage bombers fostered nomadic air tanker operators. In a time before the whereabouts of every old aircraft was known by aviation enthusiasts, the call for air tanker support could mean a fantastically surprising concentration of vintage metal that shifted airfields and reconvened throughout the summer months to serve wherever flames sprouted. A gradual winnowing of the World War II bombers due to age, crashes, and their increasing value as museum pieces coincided with a second surge of larger air tankers using post-war P-2s, P-3s, C-119s, and prop-driven Douglas four-engine airliners. The story of air tankers in firefighting applications involves science and technology, evolving techniques and equipment, skill, and luck. Air tanker pilots exhibit resourcefulness, ingenuity, skill, and the gamut of attributes ranging from pride to humility. They don't seek hero worship, but they are heroes just the same. Before the Western Migration, perhaps as many as 12 million acres of wildland burned each season, touched off by lightning. As the Western United States became increasingly populous in the 20th century, the Pacific Northwest was scarred by out-of-control fires that burned three million acres in Montana, Idaho, and Washington in August 1910. Seventy-eight firefighters and eight residents died in that inferno. 1910 became a benchmark year still visible in ancient charred stumps. To a growing nation only recently realizing its coast-to-coast -coast dream, the loss of billions of board feet of lumber was a financial and strategic wound to be healed. The fires of 1910 set in motion national wildfire policy for the first time. Federal money was made available to preempt a repeat of the 1910 disaster. Air Service biplanes flew fire patrols over the mountainous west beginning in June 1919, adding their reach to the effort. Large de Havilland DH-4 aircraft were ultimately preferred for this task. Less prescient, though undeniably imaginative, was an idea calling for transporting firefighters by dirigibles from which ladders can be lowered to the ground. But the main thrust for aircraft in wildfire control in 1919 was to be fire detection. If airplanes could fly over a fire, why couldn't they drop water on the fire? Anecdotes credit California pilot C.J. Red Jensen with installing a pair of watertight hoppers on either side of the fuselage of a surplus World War I biplane and making two drops on a fire east of Oroville, California, in 1931. By 1937, the U.S. Forest Service was testing the release of 10-gallon tin cans filled with chemicals. Some theoreticians of the day had concluded unrestrained bulk water release would be spread so thin by the aircraft's slipstream that this method, later so successful, was not tested. Instead, the small tins were dropped. This was not effective. In July 1947, two P-47Ns and a B-29 flew to Great Falls Army Air Base, Montana, on the eastern edge of Montana's divide between open range and forest land, to test the release of water-filled drop tanks and bomb casings on fires. Though the concept of aerial firefighting remained tantalizing, it was not yet deemed practical. Water bombs were not the answer. In early 1954, a Douglas AD Sky Raider tested a modified 250-gallon napalm tank, the ends of which were altered to use glass plates that could be broken by detonators activated by the pilot. A solution of water and foam was released in this way from a height of about 35 feet at 160 miles an hour. The Sky Raider placed a visible pattern on the ground 50 feet wide and 300 feet long. In 1954, Paul Mann's Air Services tested a TBM-1 Avenger modified by lining the torpedo bay with a two-compartment plywood tank. 
Total capacity of the tank was 600 gallons, verging into a respectable load size for air attack fire suppression. Early California air tankers in 1955 and 1956 dropped water, which could dissipate on the way down over a hot fire. United States Borax and Chemical Corporation, the 20 Mule Team Company, developed fire break by 1956 using sodium calcium borate as fire retardant. Though subsequently replaced by other chemical compositions, borate lent its name alliteratively to air tankers, known for many years thereafter as borate bombers. California and U.S. Forest Service experimenters evaluated the efficacy of a less expensive and lower concentration slurry of water mixed with swelling bentonite clay. Lacking borate's stark white color, bentonite blended in with its surroundings, and air tanker pilots found it difficult to see where previous drops had been made. Out of this experience came the use of red aniline dye for fire retardant. Phosphate-based liquid fertilizers showed promise as both fire retardant and subsequent vegetation enhancer. The ranks of air tanker aircraft were dominated by World War II aircraft until the early 1970s, when post-war patrol bombers like the P-2 and transports made inroads. By 2004, most of the wartime aircraft were out of the air tanker business. The U.S. Forest Service assessed two modified wide-body jet transports, a Boeing 747 and a Douglas DC-10, to explore their suitability as very large air tankers. At a cost to the company of more than $50 million, Evergreen International Aviation converted a four-engine 747 wide-body airliner into an air tanker capable of hauling more than 20,000 gallons of retardant. A huge wide-body DC-10-10 airliner was extensively modified by a company called 10 Tanker Air Carrier, based at Victorville, California. Tanker 910 carries three tanks fared to the belly of the aircraft centerline with a combined capacity of about 12,000 gallons. Vast improvements in the capacity and safety of turbine-powered agricultural aircraft spawned a renewed interest in the use of formerly disfavored single-engine air tankers now championed under the moniker SEAT, Single Engine Air Tanker. With tank capacities typically ranging between 450 and 800 gallons, SEATs were employed as a quick reaction initial air attack tool. Pioneer efforts at making seaplane scooper air tanker aircraft were accomplished by the Ontario Department of Lands and Forests in 1957. Scoopers quickly fill onboard tanks with water scooped through pipes as the aircraft skims the water's surface. Canada developed a range of seaplane scooper aircraft modified from float planes and seaplanes as large as the PBY Catalina and huge Martin Mars. A natural outgrowth was the purpose-built Canadair CL215 scooper, a utility amphibian that could perform other tasks as required. Firefighters learned early that the volume of water or chemicals that could be carried by most air tankers was more effective at corralling a blaze and slowing its spread than extinguishing it outright. Fire bosses have guide sheets to help them call for the correct amount of retardant to be released, depending on the terrain and the natural fuel that is feeding the fire. Through trial and error and deliberate experimentation, the air tanker community has amassed a body of corporate knowledge that informs modern air attack rationale. Another aircraft in the skies over a fire is the bird dog or lead plane. These aircraft coordinate airdrops and spot where tankers should release. Lead planes guide tankers over a fire by flying the route with the tanker in trail. If air tanker types and the men and women who fly and maintain them come and go, the one thing that remains constant is fire. This year's tanker crews and the public at large owe a debt to those crews who went before. This video presentation is a tribute to aerial firefighters past, present, and future.